Hi, I'm Wanda Urbanska. Call me old fashioned like Queen Elizabeth here, but I for one believe that every woman's home should be her castle. And in that castle, at least, every woman is queen, as I'm sure her royal highness would agree. But at a time when human impact on our climate is of great concern to all of us, what sort of castle we choose to live in must become a thoughtful and sustainable choice. Happily, many of us are making more environmentally responsible housing choices. Green construction and green remodeling are the major new trends in building, and that includes home building. What it all comes down to is this. When we build a new home or remodel an existing one, we have to rethink the way our parents did it or even the way we did it the first time around. For many of us, learning how to be environmentally responsible in our own living space puts us on a steep learning curve. That's been true for me as well. For years, I've saved my money and lived frugally so I could buy the first house my cat, Whiskers, could call his own. I knew I had a lot to learn about making that house as green as Whiskers' eyes. I didn't want to build a greenhouse from the ground up. The first and greenest choice is to remodel existing properties before attempting new construction. So I decided to find a house for sale right here in my hometown of Mount Airy, North Carolina. I like Mount Airy's traditional architectural styles and was dreaming of an older home with character that I could transform into my dream house one step at a time. Like my hybrid car, I wanted to color my new home green. At the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Mount Airy is a beautiful town, but because of its size, finding just the right home in just the right quiet neighborhood where my son Henry could play outdoors and maybe walk to school was a real challenge. But the day came when driving down toward the end of a quiet street, I knew it as soon as I saw it. This was the one, a mid-century brick rancher with a full basement and attic, large in its day, but these days, a not so big house. I loved not only the house, but the towering oak tree with all its shade on the west side. The grand old magnolia, that poster child for Southern grace, hospitality, and purveyor of velvety green shade spoke to me. And those iconic evergreen boxwood bushes, aren't they beautiful? I was drawn to the backyard and the woods at the edge of it, a perfect place for Henry to play and for gardening in the yard. I savored the idea of sitting out on this deck on a summer evening and sipping Henry's homemade lemonade. I thought the neighborhood was great. Established older houses and child-friendly neighbors passing by and just a 10 minute walk through the streets to Henry's school. So I'd saved up the money, not only for the purchase itself, but for the remodel. So I took a deep breath and I took the plunge. Go girl! And that is when I knew I needed help. As much oh, I'll pop these in here. Oh, awesome. green remodel before, I was in more than just a little bit over my head. Luckily, with all the interest in green living space these days, all of us have access to excellent resources. David Johnston's books, Green Remodeling and Green from the Ground Up are at the top of that list. Even better, David Johnston himself. Based in Boulder, Colorado, David has been involved in green building for decades and played a role in establishing the LEED certification standards. And by the same token, how about bringing in the editor-in-chief of Natural Home Magazine, a woman who is also the author of The Wabi Sabi House, a guide to decorating a green home. That would be Robin Griggs Lawrence. Whiskers the cat thinks Robin is the cat's meow. So the first thing I did before I made any rash moves with the house was to park David and Robin on my couch. 
we always at Natural Homes say that if you can remodel as opposed to build new, you're ahead of the game. You're already using fewer resources. You're using an existing. You're not tearing up new land. Um, you are. You know what's great about this? You're in an existing neighborhood. Uh, there's walkability. Um, you know, there's density. So already, just by moving into this house, I think you've already done a green thing. Which and what exactly did David mean by the term green building? Green building is fundamentally a tripod of three concepts. One is energy efficiency. The second is resource conservation, using resources wisely. And third is indoor air quality. And when you put the three together, you get a green building. If it's just one, if it's just energy, it's an energy star home, like your computer or your copier. If it's just indoor air quality, it's a healthy home. But that doesn't necessarily incorporate all of the attributes that lead to the benefits that a green building provides for a homeowner. I asked David to guide me with some of the most basic things for energy efficiency, like insulation, heating and cooling systems, windows, and what about natural factors like those shade trees? You know, and this magnolia tree is so stunning. Oh, it is. The thing about it, though, look how dense it is. And that works for you, and it works against you. From a summer perspective, it's a really dense shade on the house. Right. So it's great. But in the wintertime, if you look back now at the house, you can see the shade on the roof. Mm -hmm. Under the oak tree here, Right. the roof is totally in shade. In the wintertime, the sun is much lower in the sky, mm -hmm. which means this magnolia tree is going to shade the south roof. So you asked me when we talked, about solar. Right. And that shade will keep you from ever having good solar performance on the south side of the roof where solar works the best. And you would not recommend cutting trees so that you can put solar in. I'm a green guy, <laughs> partially because I really believe in trees. Trees are the lungs of our planet. As we face climate change, trees are the salvation. They're what breathe in the carbon dioxide and breathe out the oxygen for us. So no, I would never cut this magnolia tree just to put solar in. We walked around the house to show David the existing deck. So Wanda, I can see a problem right here. I don't even have to pull out my tape measure to show you, but a green building is basically a better building. It's better built, it's higher quality, but safety is a major concern with a green building, and we want safer houses. Brick is great from a fire standpoint, so that's a safer exterior surface than wood, for example. But steps, if you have elderly friends or parents coming, someone who's disabled, because you have such a differential in the heights of each of those steps, this wouldn't meet code. So this was never inspected by a code inspector. So what, what can we do here, David? What, what do well, you think? Well, let me show you what, what I'm talking about. Here, I've got a tape. And this tape shows that this step is about six inches high mm -hmm. and not even nine inches wide. Yeah. So there's a so stumble opportunity there. So an ideal step is six inches high, 12 inches wide. So you can get a full foot mm -hmm. on the step. This step, however, is over 10 inches tall mm -hmm. and 10 inches. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't work. You can't go from six inches to 10 inches. And then this top one is seven and a half inches. So every step is a different height. I get you. So what happens is you stumble right. as you yes, right. try to come up yeah. the steps. Somebody could land on their face or their elbow. Well, or... worse, coming down, they could really land on their face. Yes, they could. David suggested another way to open up the deck, making the outdoors even more accessible. In a hot climate like this, I want north-facing summer space outside. And so this wants to be a gate in my mind's eye. After his suggestions for augmenting the deck, we turned indoors where most of the upgrades would be made. So Wanda, I want to show you something. I brought my ladder so that we could look at some of your light fixtures. I noticed that you've got recessed light fixtures throughout the house. And what a recessed light fixture really is, is a hole into your attic. That heat and then air from inside the house follows the heat so the hotter it gets, just like in a chimney, Hot air goes right up the chimney, Well, warm air in the wintertime goes right up into your attic, but warm air carries moisture with it, and moisture yields mold, and mold is a big problem in this climate. So let me just show you what 
this looks like up here. If you pull this down and you look up in how this light was attached in the 50s when this house was built, you just have a metal can here that goes right up into your attic. But this metal box is full of holes, and that's for attaching it. And this house was built in the 50s, and so they didn't think about it, didn't know much, energy was cheap, didn't care. But when we go upstairs, I'll show you what it looks like from the top. So these need to go in our green remodel. These will have to go. Okay, so Wanda, since we're in here, I wanted to talk to you about your windows. And actually, why don't you sit on the couch for a second? Hi. And we can simulate a cold winter night. Right. And you're sitting on the couch having a conversation with friends, your son, and you notice over your right shoulder there's this cold airfall, like a yes. waterfall, that comes off of these windows. Now, these windows were put in with the right intention, and that's a different window that you have as a picture window, but these double-hung windows were called double-glazed windows when they were put in. But if you look at it, and you can see from that angle, there's a little silver reflection here. Mm -hmm. It's a little thin piece of aluminum that spaces the two panes of glass. For two panes of glass to really do the job, they want to be at least a half an inch apart. And this is what? And what you have here is maybe a quarter, quarter of an inch. And so where you could, our value is the resistance of heat flow through a material. So a single glazed window is an R1. A double glazed window can be an R2, so double. But this, because it's so thin, is maybe an R half. So you have an R one and a half window. Also, you have air leakage all the way around wherever these windows move. What that means is you've got air that comes in through the cracks all the way around the window. So between the cold air cracks here and the warm air going up through your lights, you have this constant convective current sucking cold air from your windows up into your attic. So you're always losing heat. And what we want to do is tighten everything up. Next stop with David, my attic. David had made it very clear how crucial attic insulation is for everyone. You talk about an urgency around climate change. I don't believe that any house is well enough insulated. It's just a wise investment. And that's something you are recommending that we do right here in this house. Absolutely. Your attic needs it desperately. <laughs> Wanda, welcome to your attic. <laughs> well, I haven't spent much time up here. Not many people get to hang out in their attic and really play. But I wanted to look at the other side of the light fixtures that we looked at in the kitchen and in the living room. So right here, where these wires come through, mm -hmm. you can see, number one, the air comes right up through the wires, but there's no insulation there at all. What the building scientists tell us is that a 4% void in your insulation reduces the effectiveness of the entire area by 50%. Amazing. So this house, when it was originally built, had two inches of insulation up here. And my guess is probably when they redid the kitchen, they came and put in the white fiber, fiberglass on top of it. On top of the yellow. On top of the old, original yellow stuff. Which has gotten moldy. Look at it. It's just totally gone, totally worthless. So what you have here is roughly R18, and what you want is probably twice that, close to R40. So what do you recommend? So given the nature of the complexity of what's here, I want to see what's coming through, like these wires, I want to see what's coming through the ceiling. So I would vacuum all of this out of here. What I would really like to see is the whole attic foamed. After the attic, so, the next stop was the basement. the basement. The furnace is probably 1950s vintage. I'm not sure it's ever been changed out. So you probably have a 65% efficiency or so, maybe 70 at most. Because mm -hmm. in those days, like the insulation, energy was so cheap that it didn't matter. What would you put in its place? I uh, like high efficiency units that are probably in the 90% range. So it's just like jumping into a hybrid from driving a big Ford 150 truck. Finally, I wanted to show David the main bathroom. So David, I love this house, but this is the one room that I don't really love. The colors, the way that it's kind of narrow, and so I do want to do put some effort onto renovating this and want to get your ideas. Bathrooms have three fundamental issues you want to think about. 
One is water, both keeping it where you want it and making sure it doesn't get where you don't want it that causes mold. Two is lighting and electrics. So what kind of light quality do you want in this room as you're putting on makeup, different times of day, morning, night, you have different lighting needs. And then third is just energy in general. How comfortable is the room? You get out of the tub or the shower, you're wet, you don't want it cold and drafty. When you have a tub like this, I don't know if you're gonna keep the tub surround or not, but this wall most likely does not have insulation in it. Aha, uh -huh, right behind it. And so what you wanna be able to do is take the drywall off that wall. In fact, what I would do is go back to the studs and get rid of drywall, put in cement board that will never mold, then put your tile or whatever back up against this and insulate that wall while you've got the wall open. So it's nice and warm in here. So time to get started, making a house into a green home. Leading the charge was Stephen Canoy, the smart and conscientious contractor that everyone needs to make sure everything's going smoothly and to do things himself like good old bathroom demolition. Isn't this fun? Naturally, I did have to start with the bathroom. I couldn't stand the color, but first things first, all of the fundamental elements that David was talking about, starting with taking out the old insulation that was virtually worthless. Then, voila, in comes the new insulation. I had a fantastic team to work with guys who examine your space carefully and know exactly where and how to apply the insulation. And the great thing about foam insulation is that once it dries, it's impenetrable. No holes, period. So you're getting the ideal sealed envelope you need for energy conservation, which is exactly the way to reduce a major source of carbon emissions generated by your home's energy use and shrink your carbon footprint. It wasn't just the attic that needed insulating. David also recommended foam insulation in the bathroom, not only for energy efficiency, but for comfort. And who can argue with that? Mike Stutzenberg, who led the installation team, once installed other forms of insulation, but no more. Well, what you have in a typical traditional house, you have several options of insulation. Uh, most common would be what we know as batted or fiberglass batted insulation. And most often that is not installed properly, but even if it is, what we end up seeing is uh, vapor and moisture drives that occur. And we call it air infiltration and with air comes moisture. Um, through that air infiltration, you have a heat loss gain uh, scenario and the foam when it's applied creates an air barrier, uh, which then allows the insulation's R value to be true. Next up were the windows. It was so much fun to see these guys doing what they do with such efficiency and grace. That gracefulness is part of what these replacement windows themselves bring permanently to the house. Russell Kale gave me the lowdown on what else to expect. There's many different types of replacement windows. Um, on this house, we use double hung, casement, and fixed frame or picture window. Here in the southeast, typically you're looking at an energy savings of $435 a year, according to the Energy Star website. That's if you're replacing single pane windows with double pane. Not that the old windows and screens, or any other usable items for that matter, should simply be thrown away. I figured, why not donate them to our local Habitat for Humanity store, where they could be sold and raise a little money for affordable housing. Later that day, when I talked to Habitat store manager, Tim Van Hoy, well, we my windows and screens were cabinets, already uh, for sale. The windows that you donated this morning for us here at Habitat, um, we uh, are certainly thankful for the windows for one example. Um, folks are always looking for a replacement. Yes. And they can also be used as art pieces. Like. Looks like you're selling them for $2, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So that's a bargain, it keeps is. them out of the waste stream. It does, it does. Um, we have used doors, uh, the screens you donated us. Uh, right. And, and, uh, and as you mentioned, these things are uh, great for folks that are on low income, that are uh, can't quite afford the, the products new in a big chain. Uh, so we serve a purpose there. But our main purpose, is, of course, is to sell 
all these items to generate funding to help build habitat homes in our area. Then there were subtler changes like Ken and Tom installing a special type of sheeting in the laundry room. I'm a fanatic about noise pollution and this sheeting promises to help keep my living space quiet. I ask Tom Gorzelski about the materials green properties. It comes from 100% recycled content taken out of the landfill and uh, we take this product called EVA. It's, uh, it's old carpets, dash inners, parts from a car that uh, we take, we recycle here in Mount Airy, we put it back in the usable form and, uh, and that comes in the sheets, four by eight sheets. Well, we've made a lot of progress by the time David returned in the winter and I was excited to show it to him. Since he'd recommended it so emphatically, the first thing to show David was the new foam insulation in the attic. This is what we were after exactly. The foam is fabulous for really sealing every spot where air could get through. Because we're not only trying to conserve heat, but we want to conserve the air movement as well. Because air carries moisture, moisture gets up into the roof like this, and then can condense and turn into mold. So with the foam, we just stop that whole process from happening. You are going to love this change more than anything else you've done except for maybe your kitchen. <laughs> because sitting here in this room with these good windows, you're not going to have that waterfall, that airfall of cold air cascading down the windows over and over again. It's just going to make so much difference from a comfort standpoint. The attic will save you money, but you can't see it. Right. These you can see and you can actually feel it. The U factor, that's how much insulation this window provides. And so your walls or your ceiling is probably in our 30, this is an R4 window. Your old windows are about R1. So you've got four times more insulation oh factor. Together with new ceiling fans and the attic insulation, the windows will cool the house dramatically in the summer. In fact, for parts of the year, I'll have what's called a floating house in which the house will be comfortable without heat or air conditioning. So all of these things work together. And when we're retrofitting a house like this, thinking of the house as a system is the vital piece. How do the windows affect comfort? How does the ceiling fan affect comfort? How does the air upstairs affect comfort? Because ultimately people can't feel their energy bill except the pain of it. <laughs> of having to pay it. <laughs> but it's the comfort in the house that they feel viscerally, and that's what you're after. Wanda, unbelievable. Look at this nice, compact little unit. This is gonna be the best decision you made to get rid of that oil burner. You don't want the price of your heat and comfort to be dependent on the Saudis and the price of oil. Right. A heat pump reverses like a typical air conditioner, it reverses in the wintertime and acts just like an air conditioner in the summertime. So one unit does it all. And it's going to save you, between the attic insulation and the windows and this unit, it's going to save you 30 or 40 percent relative to your old utility bills. Fantastic. And lower my carbon footprint, too. Lower your carbon footprint dramatically. Now on our next show, we'll carry this story forward and focus on the beauty and charm of green interiors. For that, we'll turn to Robin Griggs Lawrence. Thank you for joining me. Remember, nothing's too small to make a difference. Until next time, I'm Wanda Urbanska.